If you want to know something about transit, the best place to go is to find somebody who drives in it, works in it, sits in it all day long. And we found that person, and you know who it is. It's Dick Falkenberry, transit expert. Tonight on Public Exposure, I'm Stan Emmert. Dick, welcome back. Thanks. You forgot to mention eat in it. <laughs> <laughs> eat in it, too. And the welcome back is, is there's, there's a double entendre there. One, it's welcome back to the show because it's been a while, but two, it's been a long time since you've not been in public life as, as a board member or running for office. It was back before when you were helping to get the monorail going. Right. So welcome back from that standpoint, too. Let's talk about traffic. You, because you're in it, you, you really believe that you know what causes most of our traffic problems. I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, that make decisions don't. What people th always think it's because of the number of cars that are moving down the street. It's oh, not the cars that are moving down the street, it's the cars that aren't moving. It's the accidents, the breakdowns, the stalls. Yes, there are choke points and things like that. When you get off the freeway and are seeking a parking place, when you're coming off of uh, Union Street on I-5 and mm -hmm. it's, there's a traffic light 40 feet away from the freeway. But it's those accidents and breakdowns that are so bad and so detrimental. Uh, okay, I, I'm not, I mean, we have that many accidents because I, I get in traffic problems just about every day. It doesn't take one, it doesn't take a lot. It, the traffic accident doesn't have to be in your lane of traffic because when it stops a car, then people go around mm -hmm. and those people then affect the cars to their right, to their right, and their right. And that's why adding more lanes isn't going to help because the cars that are stuck in traffic are moving over into those new lanes. All you're doing is just spreading the misery a little bit when you add more lanes. So do we add more buses? Do we add more trains? We add a couple things. But mostly we, what we do is we do traffic management. You know, i got to ask you this. I, have, uh, I used to work in D.C. I spent a good bit of time in New York. And I noticed that if there's a wreck there, you better move your car somehow to the side of the road. At least. Be, because the rest of traffic will push you off. Yeah. But here, it's like we have a parade. <laughs> well, it's, it's, partly it's Seattle polite, partly it's the, the new litigation. I, I imagine maybe if you went back to New York and uh, Washington, it might be worse because there no longer are, are $200 accidents where you go get your bumper fixed and you're, you're back on the road. And, $200, okay, your insurance company takes care of it. Now it's, the, the minimum accident is sort of $850 and up. And so people are concerned. They want to know how much it's going to cost, you know, who's going to fix it, who's going to pay for it and all that. But yes, we have, we have way too much acceptance of the idea that because a car is stopped in the middle of the road, there must be okay to do that. I saw a guy fixing his tire 30 feet before the exit on the Ballard Bridge. Really? Yes. Now, you can drive a, approximately three miles on a, bat, on a flat tire before you really ruin it. And, and you really ought to think to yourself, because the chances of getting hit are pretty good, uh -huh. that you really ought to go ahead and ruin it just to drive off of a really dangerous area, like a freeway, like a place like Boward Bridge. If your car, tire, used tire, costs $100, it's certainly worth it to, to drive it right off the rim to get off of that dangerous situation. Yeah. But, but for example, we have all kinds of things where that happens, where we, don't, where we don't just say, oh, this is crazy. Let's push these things out of the way. For example, state troopers don't push cars out of the way when they've had an incapacitating situation. Why not? And, well, one thing is we love our cars too much. We love our cars so much that we will not damage those cars. Let, give me an example. I read this incredible story about how this, this, this cop came up to a scene where there, somebody's car trailer was stuck on the railroad tracks and he knows that a commuter train is coming. And he managed heroically to, to get this car off, literally manually pulled the trailer off. But they didn't point out that he could have just taken his, his patrol car and just pushed this thing off the tracks because if the train hits it, it's going to derail. Yeah. But we love our vehicles so much we don't want to even scratch them. 
Well, that's nuts, though. No, but, but it's true. But the other it's thing, it's true. We absolutely are crazy about our cars. But something that I've seen here, though, yeah, he, I mean, and here more than anywhere else in, in the country, is that we will have a, you know, kind of a minor accident, <laughs> and, we'll, and there'll be three three police cars out there, yeah, and they all have their sirens going, and everybody's rubbernecking, and they're looking at it, and it just seems dumb to me. Get your car on the side of the road, let traffic flow, and one, and one cop. Yeah, and one cop. Yeah. Problem is we don't have enough crime to keep them really busy. I, I saw five police That's a problem. I saw five police officers and cars uh, uh, taking care of a, a beggar who had probably thumped a car when it went by without giving him money. Hmm. So so we're way too unbusy. But but that's 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 not part of the problem. The problem is you tell them, take care of this problem quickly, figure out what's wrong and let's go. Yeah. Let's talk about trains and traffic, particularly on MLK. The okay. train is now light rail. Light rail. And so, you know. Which is anything but light. Those things yeah. weigh 100,000 pounds per car. And for some reason, whatever the reason was, and maybe it was a pure financial reason, but that's what we did. We decided to put it at the same level as the street. Right. Now, some people will say, well, it's not really at grade because it's, it's slightly above it. But it still yeah. stops a car. It still stops a human being. No, actually. And, Why did and we when do they, that? When they went to elevate it in, in the Tukwila area. Mm -hmm. They did it because it was almost physically impossible to put it at surface. They saved $40 million a mile. Because, you mean you save money when you yes, elevate? Yes, of course. Because, I thought it was way more expensive. Because when you elevate, you're only taking care of the soil every 100 feet. Uh -huh. You drill a hole, you put the pipe in, the column, and then you put the... But when you're doing on the surface, you have to take care of every inch of that surface all the way along for about 15 feet down. And so it's much more expensive to go uh, surface an elevator. So here, that's why one reason why your telephone wires are up in the air rather than dug in a trench on the ground. Now, why is that? Because it's because it's cheaper to put it's them cheaper up to pole. put them up there. Oh, and, but sure, it's not. Sure. But it, and it's cheaper to drive up there too. But we just yeah. decided not to do that because of why? Because it apparent the surface when we first started putting down roads in 1890 McAdam roads. You just laid them on the ground, but that's no longer the way we do yeah, it. We're not, just the way we don't lay railroad tracks on the bare ground anymore. They go down deep and they massage the soil and they fix it. And when you don't do that, like along the waterfront trolley in the 1980s, they had to come back four years later and replace all those tracks. But this was just a few years ago that we put the, the, the link light rail down through the middle of MLK, right, right. a great big huge road. Right. This isn't 18 something or 1980s, this is 2007, 2008. We're still doing, we're still doing basically the the United States automobile and the worldwide automobile is still basically based on the four-wheeled wagon. For example, our, no, seriously, our, our cars should have two wheels that are not the same as the other two wheels, and we would weigh, wear out the pavement half as fast. But wagons were made with four wheels in the corners, and that's why we do it. Absolutely. Wow, it's this chuck wagon gang. Just make it uh, we hot, haven't changed hot, brown, since, and plenty since, of it. Since 1700s. All right. So we're following the same pattern. But in Vancouver, B.C., they seem to be smarter than we are, and that's just a, a 150 well, they, miles away. The they Vancouver also make some, some classic mistakes, too, yeah. though. They used an old railroad tunnel, and to save some money, in one mile of the, air, of the uh, light rail, and the problem is their trains are very narrow and can only hold a very small number of people. Mm. But the, the SkyTrain, though, is, is it that... It works well, except that it doesn't haul a large, large number of people. They well, have well, a can't finite you just number. Add, but can't you just add a car? No, at some point you, you kind of have a finite length you can go to. Oh, I see. But you can go... They could go further, but... but, but they're pretty much at where they. Well, all right. Feel. Well, let's say that you have it's. It, you can only put five cars on a SkyTrain. Right. And I, the consumer, know when it's going to going to be here because you know traffic is not getting in the way of it. Right. So that works. And so I know that you know 15 minutes later I'll catch the next one. Not only that, they have no schedules. When we went to visit them, one of our people at the monorail board went to find the schedule. He says, "Don't bother." And she goes, "Why?" He goes. By the time you find a schedule, the train will be here. In other words, they're so frequent that 
in the time it would take you to figure out when the next train's coming, there's going to be another one here. All right, so let's get back then to... So that makes a great system. So let's get back then to the train going up and down MLK, right. which impedes traffic and traffic impedes it. Does it right. get to go as fast as, as it could? Not only that, it, it not only doesn't get to go as fast as it can, it doesn't matter whether traffic is actually impeding it because it might impede it. So they have to slow down. Steel wheels on steel tracks can't stop very quickly. And so just on the chance that somebody might turn in front of them, that a kid might run across the street, even a dog, you have to slow down to under 30 miles an hour. Why did we do that? Do we not know any better? Are the Canadians a lot smarter than we are? I would suspect it's a, a, a large number of things, but uh, first and foremost is, is that the light rail people are the literally the sons and grandsons of the railroads, and there's nobody better at lobbying. Those people are fabulous at lobbying. You've got to remember that the light rail people gave well over $50,000 to the Sound Transit campaign for approval in 1995. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we made, there was no way they were going to go with another system. Uh, the other problem you have is, is that light rail has become the predominant inner urban in, in in trial yeah, but it's old, system, old, old and it technology. doesn't work anywhere. Yeah, okay, so you Except say... Except for one place. Where? San Diego, the first one. The San Diego system goes from the naval yard down to the Mexican border and takes the sailors who don't have cars, and it goes along an old railroad track which is almost completely isolated. So they can go very fast, and it was a very good system and it's serving a population that needs them and has almost no alternative. And so the first system they put in hit the jackpot and everybody said, that's what we need, without looking at the fact that, they, that that is almost a unique market and a unique situation that probably will never be equaled again. Okay, so let's go. It was brilliant. Let's, let's go then again to st stay with Sound Transit. And when I think of Sound Transit, I think of the Link Light Rail, even though Sound Transit is much more than that. Yeah. But it's the, the the buses, for example, of Sound Transit is just simply Metro Community Transit, and and the Tacoma Transit. All they do is just rent their buses and paint them, <laughs> but they're but they're actually not doing anything. That, for example, they don't administer them and all that. And so all of that could have been done. All the bus service of Sound Transit could have been done by these other systems just by adding more money. But talking about impact, but we've got another layer of bureaucracy. Yeah, but, yeah. but talking about impact on transit, impact right. on traffic, right. impact on my life, right. the Sound Transit stops, the, the link light rail. The link, let's talk about link. Yeah. Build it and they will come, but there's, uh, there is a, actually there's two transit centers or, or link light rail stops within two miles of my house. Right. And I can't find one of them. Right. Even though, you know, that's probably because I'm not on foot. Yeah. And the other one, I think I know where it is. Right. My case in point, I'm not walking there because I live in a city of hills. I live in a city of rain. It's, it's not so much that. It's you're not walking there because when you get there, you don't know that there will be a train immediately. Why not? Because of the fact that they're on the surface. So in other words, in New York, you're willing to walk, I believe it's about an average of six blocks to the subway stop. Yeah. Because even in that city, which isn't particularly conducive to walking. You've got the humidity in the summer, mm -hmm. snows in the winter. But it's so, flat. And it, but it's flat. Manhattan but it's, is. But, and sometimes it's not the most particularly lovely walk in the world. True. But the point is, they are willing to walk because when they get to the subway, because it has its unique and separated trackage, you know, right away, you know there's going to be a train there. If, if we could guarantee a train every five minutes, I promise you that you would find a way to get to that station. One of the other problems is, I believe you live near Pekin Hill, mm -hmm. you have, your tunnel is, your station is almost 300 feet below ground. So it's going to take you a number of minutes to get from the top of the surface level, on top of the hill, mm -hmm. down to the bottom of the underground station. So, For example, the, the, the downtown bus tunnel takes on average three minutes to go from the surface on 3rd Avenue down to the bus. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, you, could, you can get there faster, say from Beacon Hill to downtown, than you can get from the surface down to your tunnel entrance. Not in many cases, but, but what the problem really? is... Really? 
you've always got to remember that, that it's door-to-door -door time. It's not merely the ride. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Because about, that's a human being's uh, time right, exactly. is the door-to-door -door time. Exactly. we got to take a break. We're very fortunate to have Dick Falconberry with us. Dick Falconberry, as many of you know, uh, is uh, one of the prime sponsors. He, his idea was the Seattle Monorail. Dick came up with that idea in response to the tremendous amount of traffic that he was in every single day uh, in his professional job. And as a result of that, he has come to, to know so much about traffic, traffic patterns, and how to avoid some of the most difficult circumstances that we have as being one who is a passenger and or a driver in a car. So, Dick, let's get back to this. What I have been hearing so much from Sound Transit and from those who espouse the, the religion of light rail is a lack of understanding consumers, a lack of understanding human beings. Well, for example, the light right rail goes out to the airport, but it stops a thousand feet from the nearest door of the concourse. Yeah. That's very deliberate. They did never intended to build that for passengers going to the airport. Well, what is it built for? It's built for the, the employees at the airport. There are about 10,000 employees at the airport. Probably 85% of them earn $10 an hour or less. So how many hundreds of millions of dollars did I spend for 10,000 people? Right. And not only that, but think of the fact that you have a car rental facility nearby. And they can't put people on the link light rail to take them to the one mile away car rental agency. So what they've set up is something like a $40 million uh, uh, bus system to shuttle people from the airport to the, uh, to the car rental. That's that big garage you see at about uh, what is 150th in the Pack Highway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's going to cost $17 million a year to operate, the bus shuttle. Really? Right. So had they simply taken... Wow, can I have that contract? Yeah. Had they simply taken the uh, link light rail into the concourse uh -huh. and then simply had a catwalk-like sky bridge station over... To the, well, one thing you would have done is you might have freed up enough parking spaces in those circular mm -hmm. parking lots to put the car rentals, and then you wouldn't need any kind of shuttle at all. So why did we do it the way we did it? To create jobs. Okay. All right. Got that. Most, most, transit, most traffic things are, have very little to do with, with moving people and mostly about creating jobs. Let's take, talk about a look, take a look at the I-90 ramp from I-5 southbound to I-90. The second vehicle that went through there, you're supposed to slow down to 35, the second vehicle through on the day they cut the ribbon hit the wall and crashed. <laughs> but here's the point, nobody thinks that's bad. Nobody says, oh my God, why? And we own all that land. We own literally 100 acres of right of way in that area. Mm. Why don't we, instead of having this very shallow or very, very steep curve, why didn't we move it over to the east a little bit and have a direct shot? And the reason why is, I'm not sure whether anybody sits down and says, well, we're going to have to come back and fix this someday, and that's another $50 million, but that's what's going to happen. Huh. Well, are, you have talked about, let's, let's continue on with, with impact on traffic. You've talked about how downtown parking, yeah. or lack thereof, actually yeah. negatively impacts traffic. Very I, much so. How, how so? I don't understand that. Well, first thing, parking. I've come to the conclusion that one of the reasons why you need transit is for the parking. If everybody who worked downtown came down and, sh and who wanted to shop and to visit and to do errands came downtown and tried to find a parking place, there's, there's no way we could create enough parking places. We'd have to have huge. So about 40% of the people that work downtown arrive by transit. But the transit buses, for example, are causing almost as much congestion as they believe. They have to stop and pick up people. Yeah, they're milk wagon runs. And, and they have to stop at the uh, uh, traffic lights and everything else. And they get stuck in traffic. But they also, by getting stuck in traffic, create a lot more trouble even behind them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Parking is a huge problem in the sense that it creates congestion. And about 20% of the cars downtown are actively looking for a place to park. 
20% of the cars downtown Town that are, are driving around driving are looking around, for a looking, place to park. Not only that, but they've gone to their favorite spot. I've been a lot spot. of that 20%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just spent, I had a couple errands downtown, and I spent a, a good number, probably a mile, driving around looking for a place to park. And finally, I just left it on the city hall plaza. I figure, what the heck? <laughs> nobody, nobody will notice. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing problem. I mean, there, there is some good news. I was talking earlier about traffic management. And, and you know, the, the computer is going to allow us to do some things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm convinced that there will be an app pretty quickly that you drive into the central part of the city, and it will tell you in real time reality of where the parking place is ahead of you. So that mm -hmm. they will say two blocks ahead of you, on the left-hand side are three spots. Well, that would be brilliant, but would this city council and this mayor want to tax that? Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the for, problems for is that's simple there. information, and I'm not sure you can tax that easily. Now, one of the things you could do is go to the app people and say, you know, one of the problems is they say, okay, you're going to charge. What are you going to charge for that? You're going to charge, let's just... Say it was a dollar and a half. Okay, for the hour app. and a half. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you tell them, if we tax it up to, you know, let's say 50 cents every time you use that, that's actually better because it makes your product look better. It's $2 instead of $1.50. That's a better product. Now, I mean, that's kind of crazy, but I think, mm -hmm. I don't think they would fight it that much. Now, unfortunately, yes, we're looking for all kinds of ways to tax. So isn't... But let me, there's some, a lot of other things you can do. There are traffic light systems where it doesn't merely know that there's a car coming and there's five cars waiting. We ought to go ahead and let these five cars go and stop the one car. But it will learn that at 3 o'clock, at 3.05 on a Saturday, there is going to be five cars and four of those want to turn left. And so it will learn to turn on the left turn mechanism. Uh, and, and it gets smarter as it goes along and it moves traffic more smoothly. Isn't that a hugely expensive uh, proposition? It's less expensive than traffic, as, as far as congestion. But one of the problems you have with that is there's nobody's name on it. It is not the Harry Pettis, you know, uh, uh, memorial traffic control system. It doesn't have the glamour. It doesn't have the kind mm -hmm. of thing that you can put on a traffic, on a brochure when you're running for office. Well, okay. I'm the one who came in here, and I'm the one who got traffic moving because I got smart rather than built concrete. There's no jobs associated with it. So I, I, I got to put this picture up. There's sure. a picture of city council, county council, right. and the executives of, of the city and the county and the Governor Gregoire. What you're right. saying is that none of them no. have, the, have the willingness to make traffic changes that need to be made. No, made. I don't think that's true. I think they've done some things. Uh, some things are wrong, but they've done some things. Uh, the, new, the new lights on the freeway, which I detest, but the ones that slow you down, mm -hmm. say slower traffic ahead, yeah. and then you have variable traffic, they appear to be working. They appear to actually reduce the number of accidents. The problem, I think, is they're overusing them, and pretty soon people, I see them come up, they force you to go down to 50 miles an hour, and I can see there's almost no traffic. Now, up and over the hill there is, but I'm not... I'm smart enough to know that it's going to be in another two miles, not this mile. Yeah. But there are things that we're going to learn as we go along of what really works and what really doesn't. And, and we shouldn't shoot the, 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 the person when, they make, when, when the first thing doesn't work out perfectly. Why can't this mayor and this city council say to the Seattle Police Department, say, look, you know, get one car, one police, uh, a police car out there at a, a non-injury accident and get the car on the side of the road so that we can get traffic moving again and, and turn your blue lights off. One of the problems we have is that, that we have made mistakes, I think, with the police before, and so they have the upper hand on it and saying, don't tell us how to do this. We know what we're doing. Now, one of the things you can do is go to them in a cooperative mood and say, we've got, let's talk about how to move traffic. Let's talk about traffic accidents. One of the things that's going to change is the next car you buy will almost undoubtedly have a camera in the front. And when somebody rear ends you, you'll be able to prove, and they'll have front and back, you'll be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt very quickly like that. You won't need a police officer there. So the, the cost of my next car is going to be more expensive so that I can protect my lawyer? 
your insurance costs will go down. My insurance costs. In fact, will go down. Your you won't be able to get insurance sometime soon if you don't have these cameras, mm -hmm. because the cost of investigating an accident. Believe it or not, when I was at Gray Line, mm -hmm. the average bus accident cost twenty thousand dollars to investigate. The average. Really? Yes. Wow. And so, and we is didn't less, have cameras. Is it less and now? We still don't. No, we still don't have cameras. Yeah. Um, we, we really we, should just get. We really should get. Not only should we, but but you know those backup cameras are only five hundred dollars. Yeah, actually but, they're but, less than that at Costco. Are they really? Uh, yeah. Um, let's go down. Let's. We got time. Yeah. It's close. We can go <laughs> yeah, down we'll, right now. We'll, we'll yeah. Um, we talked in preparation for the show about how if there were smaller cars, if there were, if right. everybody drove smart cars, that things would be much better. Why? Well, again, it's the parking. The parking is the real curse of the 20th century. It's actually, I don't think the driving is so bad, but the parking is just horrendous. Here's an incredible statistic. Uh -huh. There are seven parking spaces. We're not including rural highways. We're talking urban streets, parking spots, shopping malls, all that. There are seven spots per car in this country. Yeah, how about in this city? I, I, but what you my don't point know is, my point seven is, spots per we car. have paved an awful lot of America <laughs> for, for parking, parking. And, and we spend a lot of time so looking then for it. Isn't the solution Partly. the direction that we're going, which is get rid of cars? No. We'll never get rid of cars. Okay. They really are. You'll never take a group of, of 12 sacks of leaves on the, on the monorail mm -hmm. to the dump. That's not going to happen. Speaking of the monorail, we got a minute left. Okay. Um, I, you know, we don't have enough time to go into this, right. but you know, uh, the monorail project that you worked on, you worked yeah. very hard. You put your heart into it. A lot of people were behind it with you. And a little blood. <laughs> what makes you sad now? Well, it's, you know, I look at what could have been, and I do tours, and I tell people we could have been 20 feet over the ground, flying over the city, and not only would tourism spread out to places like Ballard and West Seattle and Rainier Beach, uh, but what makes me hopeful is is that I think that, that there's going to be a resurgence in interest, and I, I think it's going to come from the private sector. And with that, that's got to be the, the last word. Thank you very much, Dick Falkenberry. Transit, it's a problem for all of us, and there might be some very inexpensive solutions right outside. We'll see you next week right here on Public Exposure. Take care.